thought um, last week, due to the Thanksgiving holiday, we were able to read a Puritan prayer together, which I thought was very nice. So I thought we would do it to get again today as we are beginning the Advent season. This is entitled, The Gifts of Gifts from the Valley of Vision, and I thought we could read it responsibly. So I will read the regular text, and you can join me with the bold text. O source of all good, what shall I render to you for the gift of gifts, your own dear son? Herein is his wonder, wonder of wonders. He came below to raise me above, was I was born like me, that I might become like him. Again. Herein is love, when I cannot rise to him, he draws near on wings of grace to raise me to himself. Herein is power, when deity and humanity were infinitely apart, he united them in an indissoluble unity, the uncreated and the created. Here in his wisdom, when I was undone, with no will to return to him, and no intellect to revive the recovery, he came, God incarnate, to save me to the uttermost, as man to die by death, to shed satisfying blood on my behalf, to work out a perfect righteousness for me. O God, take me in spirit to the watchful shepherds, and enlarge my mind. Let me hear good tidings of great joy, and hearing, believe, rejoice, praise, adore, my conscience bathed in an ocean of repose, my eyes uplifted to a reconciled Father. Place me with ox, donkey, camel, and goat, to look with them upon my redeemed face, and in him count myself delivered from sin. Let me with Simeon clasp the newborn child to my heart, embrace him with undying faith, exulting that he is mine and I am his. In him you have given me so much that heaven can give no more. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. If you're able to stand with me as we read God's Word together, please do so. 1 Peter 2, verses 11 through 12. And here's what the Word of God says. Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, welcome. I'm so glad that those of you who are able to be here today were able to come. And I'm also glad for those who are able to join um, by live streaming. I know that there are certain circumstances in the world right now which prohibit some of you from being here and that's okay we love you and we're glad for you as well um, there was a time in which we were all strangers to the things of god and in a sense we were strangers to god himself i i find it fascinating actually that jesus says that there will come a time when some people will say to him, Lord, didn't we do all these various things for you? And the Lord will say to them, get away from me, I never knew you. It's fascinating because, well, God is God, and so he knows all things, he knows all creatures, he knows every person, uh, but what Jesus is saying there is that he never knew those people in a saving way. He never had a redeeming relationship with those people. And, as I said, there was a time in each of our lives when that also was the case for us. Because we are not born naturally into the family of God. That's the reason why Jesus says 
to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, in order to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Not just born the first time. And John's gospel in chapter 1 makes that also abundantly clear. When John says that we are children not by our flesh or a husband's desire, not even by our own wills, but rather chosen by God. Actually, we've been learning about that in our study of 1 Peter. Last time we met together, we learned that Peter says about believers, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That means that God, in his mercy, chose us to have a relationship with him, to make us his children by adoption, not naturally, but by adoption. That's why adoption actually is a beautiful thing. I know that there's adopted people in this room. You can attest to the fact that you are now part of a family that at one time you were not a part of, and now you are a part of it. That's a, a picture of what God actually does for us. And now that we are reconciled to God, the result of that is that instead of being strangers to God now, now we are strangers to the world. We are aliens and pilgrims in the world. See, we don't have to look for UFOs to see aliens. All we have to do is look around this room. There's a bunch of aliens in the room right now. All right? And so we must learn to act like aliens. Aliens to the world. And that's what Peter is going to show us today from our text in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12. Before I read that, I'd just like to pray one more time that the Lord would open our hearts to hear his word this afternoon. Oh Lord, we love you and thank you so much for your choice in redeeming us, for drawing us to yourself. What a marvelous thing it is to know the love of God. And I pray that the love of God would dwell in our hearts and that your word would be effective to us and that you would use it in our lives, even in this moment, today, Lord. Speak to us, convict us of sin, cleanse us of sin, and draw us further and deeper into your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Peter writes, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. So, as I said before, in verse 9, I just read verses 11 and 12. In verse 9, Peter says about believers that we are a holy nation. That is, a nation which is made up of people from every geographical nation, and every tribe, and every language. It's a nation whose constituency is holy in God's Sight. He calls that which is not as though it were. And we talked about that the last time we were together as well. That we might not always feel like we're holy, but God has declared us holy for we are in Christ. And he sees us as what we shall be as well. Because he knows the end from the beginning. And there will come a time when actual holiness and perfection will be a part of our own constitution. When we are remade and glorified in the kingdom of heaven. And so this nation um, is also a, a part of a kingdom. The, the, the kingdom of God, which Jesus says is not of this world. Jesus tells Pontius Pilate in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... My servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So the subjects 
of King Jesus are citizens of a kingdom which is foreign to every kingdom or nation of this current world. This is so important for us to realize that the kingdom of heaven is something which is foreign to kingdoms of the world. There are certainly Christians in, by this time, most likely every nation of the world. But the kingdom of heaven itself is something different from the kingdoms of the world. I think that that has been confused in history a lot of times. Um, and even sometimes confused in the church. Where the church has sought to make the kingdoms of the world into the kingdom of God. And there's only, only one person who can do that. And we know from the scriptures when that's going to happen. Revelation tells us now the kingdoms of our God and are, of the world are the kingdom of God. So like at that time when Christ returns, at that point he's going to consolidate every kingdom into his kingdom. I mean that's when that's going to happen. And not before that. It will not happen before that. And so that means that we who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, our allegiance is to Him above our allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Our allegiance is to Him above our allegiance to any earthly ruler. And so when the Bible says in, for instance, Romans 13, and in the very next passage, Lord willing, that we're going to study in 1 Peter, that we need to submit to authorities... That's true in as far as those authorities are governing us according to the Lord's will. So that if there's ever an authority which commands us to sin, we have a, a higher king. We belong to a higher kingdom. We're a part of a kingdom that uh, has a king that has uh, greater laws than man's laws. So for instance, if there was a law passed that said that a pastor could no longer preach about the sinfulness of a particular sin. Well, I would have to disobey that law because God tells me to preach about it, right? Or if there's a, some kind of law passed that says you have to bow the knee to Caesar, I would have to disobey that law because I have no king but Christ. And so we're part of this other kingdom. And as subjects to King Jesus, we're part of this kingdom that's foreign. That's why Peter calls Christians foreigners and strangers. Look at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust. See, it's really interesting that Peter himself would say that. Because Peter is, you know, one of the leaders at the church. Where? Where was Peter typically for most of his ministry after the resurrection. Jerusalem, right? And who is he writing this letter to? Well, to the people in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Those are all what? Foreign nations, right? But what Peter is talking about here is that those Christians who are a part of those nations, they're foreign in regard to Israel, but he's talking about a greater foreignness. The kingdom of God's foreignness to the world, right? And he says that they are true foreigners and strangers. It's pretty amazing. Peter's saying here that as believers, we are no we no longer belong to this world. We are we're purchased out of it. We were purchased by the precious blood of Christ. And that's the reason why the apostle Paul says, "Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. So not only does the world no longer have a claim on us, also we don't even have a claim on us. Think about that. I don't have a claim on myself. I'm no longer my own. I've been purchased out of slavery. Listen. I've been purchased out of slavery, not only to the power of the devil, but also slavery to my own flesh. That's what the blood of Jesus is able to purchase us out of. 
We no longer have to be slaves even to our own desires and our own flesh. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. What's the price? He tells us. It's the precious blood of Christ. Christ paid for us by his death on the cross, by the shedding of his blood. That was the cost of our redemption. That was the, the price at which he bought us. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 20, Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Right? Why? Well, because God owns our bodies now. Since we were purchased, the imagery here that Paul uses, the imagery that Peter is using here is foreigners and strangers now because we belong to the kingdom of heaven, um, is an imagery of slavery. It's slavery. We are doulos, slaves of Christ. I'm encouraged, actually. There's a new Bible translation that is about to be released uh, that is a slight variation on the NASB. It's being done by John MacArthur and people at John MacArthur Seminary. It's called the Legacy Translation of the Scriptures, where they're going to change some pretty significant things um, in the translation of the text. Now, the meaning isn't different, but, well, in some ways the meaning is different. So, for instance... They will translate the word doulos as slave. And that's really important because when Paul introduces himself, you know, to in the vast majority of his letters in Philippians, in Romans, in Galatians, he, he talks about himself as doulos, Paul, a slave of Christ. But in most modern translations, it does not say slave, it says servant. There's all kinds of different servants, right? But the meaning there is very specific. The meaning is slave. We need to recover that. And, and uh, I know some people think that, you know, the, 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 the imagery, especially for Americans with, like, chattel slavery in the 19th century, it's too offensive. Well, the reality is no one is alive today who was ever a part of chattel slavery. And we can, you know, reclaim the biblical meaning of that word. What it means to be a slave of Christ. The other thing that I really like about the, this new translation that's coming out is that um, they're planning on translating the Tetragrammaton, the Lord's name, as Yahweh, uh, which is his name. So that's just really interesting. Very, very brief rabbit trail here. That like... You know, when the Lord says over and over throughout the Old Testament, something like, then you will know that my name is the Lord. It's like, well, what does that even mean? You'll know my name. Well, of course I know your name is the Lord. You're the Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. Like, you're the Lord, right? Well, when the Lord says that his name is Lord, what he's saying is not, then you will know my name is the Lord. What he's saying is, then you will know that my name is Yahweh who is doing these things. In other words, you'll know that I'm not Asherah, and I'm not Baal, and, and I'm not Allah, and I'm not Buddha, and I'm not any of those others. I'm Yahweh, and you'll know that my name is Yahweh when you see my hand do all of these things in whatever context he's saying it, right? I'm going to get that translation. Probably preaching out of it as soon as it comes out. So, we were purchased by the blood of Christ. And what that makes us then is the slaves of God. We're the slaves of God. Now, before you get bent out of shape by that, like, oh, I'm not a slave. What do you mean? That's. Isn't that what the Pharisees said to Jesus? We've never been slaves of anyone! Right? Which is hilarious. I guess they just, you know, I don't know, forgot about Pharaoh. Right? <laughs> and what does Jesus say in John chapter 8? Well, whoever sins is a slave to sin. And the, the modern prophet, Bob Dylan, famously said, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. 
That's just the truth. Human beings were created to be slaves, to serve, to be servants or slaves. We were. And we are either slaves to sin, our flesh, and hell, and the devil, or we're slaves to God. And there's really no other option. But slavery to God is not like slavery to the devil. Slavery to God is actually freedom and joy and peace. Slavery to the, to the devil is sadness and sorrow and hell. I mean, it's, it's, it's an entirely different thing to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not a cruel taskmaster. He is a good master who not only treats us as his servants, which we are, but he also treats us as his children and his brothers and his friends. It's amazing. So when, when Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust. What he's saying is, I urge you to abstain from those things because you belong to a new master now. You're no longer a slave to your sin. We are in the world, but we are no longer of the world. And therefore, we are foreigners to the world and strangers in the world. But his point is not just that that's what we are. Listen now. His point is not just that that's what we are. His point is that since that's what we are, we now need to do something. And that something that we need to do is to abstain from fleshly lusts. Remember this. It was in response to Peter's confession. Jesus Asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? They said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others from the prophets. And then he said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Luke chapter 9, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus then goes on right after that, and he says this. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me. Look at that. That's so profound. That's so profound. So, literally, Peter, the same Peter who's writing this letter to us, was standing there when Jesus says that if we are to be his disciples, part of being a disciple of Christ is self denial. It is Abstention. It is abstaining from what we naturally desire to do, to follow the sin of our flesh. It is making a choice, actually, to do that, to abstain from fleshly lust. That's what Peter's talking about here. To deny oneself, one must abstain from fleshly lusts. Okay, so what are these lusts, and why should we abstain from them? Uh, perhaps the most obvious one in our minds are, are immediately goes to sensual lusts. Um, considering the fact that the word lust itself is almost always connected to illicit sexuality or illicit sensuality. But this exhortation from Peter actually has a deeper application than merely sex. The Greek word for flesh here the root word is sarx, and Paul uses that word commonly to refer to inherent human sinfulness. I want to um, just draw your attention briefly to the way that Paul uses that word um, in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16. All right, so Peter says, abstain from fleshly lusts. This is what Paul says about fleshly lusts. Uh, Galatians 5.16 But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay. Alright. When we walk by the Spirit, we won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Or, or another way to say that would be the lust of the flesh. Here's, here it is. For the lust of the flesh 
or the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing these things you want to do, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, here's, now he, here he tells us what these things are that Paul is talking about, and that obviously Peter is also talking about. It's the same spirit who inspired Paul to write Galatians. It's the spirit that inspired Peter to write First Peter. He says this, verse 19 of Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Okay, that's obvious. That's the first one, right? Lust. Lust of the flesh. Sexual immorality. Impurity, sensuality, so all of those sort of go together uh, under that theme of sensual desire. Okay, but not only those, verse 20, idolatry, that's of the flesh, sorcery, enmity, hatred of other people, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you, as I warned before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And those, uh, and against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us also not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay. And so when Peter just writes most likely after Paul here and says... I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. These are the things that Peter is referring to here. People can have a lust for illicit sensuality, for sure. But you can also have a lust for idols. You can have a lust for alcohol. You can have a lust for blood. Bloodlust. Right? You can even have a lust for blood that's not real blood. You can have a lust for blood in the entertainment that you watch. I want to see something violent to gratify this desire that I have inside just to see something die. I want to see it. Right? I want to see blood. And all of these fleshly lusts actually come naturally to all of us. They do. Now, you might not say, well, you know, I don't, I'm not naturally a jealous person. Yeah, I mean, you know, until someone gives you reason to be jealous. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I don't, I don't really envy other people, you know. Well, you might not envy certain things like you... You know, you might not, if you're a woman, you might not envy your neighbor's 4x4 four four truck, you know, necessarily. But you might envy something else, the kitchen, that, that the neighbor's wife has. <laughs> you know, that was a total stereotype. I don't mean it in that way. So, so, <laughs> right. <clears throat> These things come naturally to all of us. And what Peter says to us is that we must abstain, abstain from them. So what, what does it mean to abstain from all these things that Paul lists? Sex, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife. Well, to abstain means to keep away from, to be distant from, to keep far from yourself, to make a choice to do that. How can we practice abstinence from fleshly lusts since they come naturally to us? Well, this is how. We exercise the freedom which Christ has given us to make choices to do so. I know that that sounds like, what? 
That's pretty simple. Yes. It is. It's not complicated. If you know Jesus, there was a time in your life when you did not have the choice but to obey your flesh. Your will was in bondage to sin. If you want to read a really fascinating and wonderful book, a book which Martin Luther said all of his other books could be burned in the flames, but I would not want this one to be. It's his book that he wrote um, in answer to another scholar who had written about man's will, saying that man has libertarian type of free will, and Luther wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will. That book is so wonderful, it shows from the scriptures how man's will is naturally at enmity to God and in bondage to sin. But what Christ has done for us is that he's enabled us to have freedom from that. Freedom from the bondage to sin. Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, free for what? There was a time, says Paul, that we were free from righteousness. Right? That's the kind of freedom we used to have. A freedom which was free from righteousness. There was no righteousness in it at all. But now we are different. Now we can actually make individual choices to say no to sin and to say yes to God and yes to righteousness. To deny ourselves and to actually die to ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. That Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit actually enables us to do so. Like, oh, but pastor, you don't understand how strong my addiction is. Sure I do. Sure I do. Because I'm a human being too. Addiction doesn't only have to do with drugs. You can be addicted to a lot of different things. And the point is that if you know Christ, He enables you to overcome that, to die to that, to crucify the flesh. That's the reason why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, For I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by the Spirit. But like, this is the point. How do we abstain? Well, you must make the choice to abstain. I know someone who said, well, it's... it's you know, so and so is a drug addict, and, and they they say that they're a Christian, but they they just can't make that choice. And my only answer to that is, you know, I can't judge a person's heart. I don't know where they stand before Christ. My answer is that the Bible says otherwise, and that I've actually heard real testimonies from people who were under the similar types of oppress oppression and fleshly, the grip of the flesh, the grip of, you know, what is called addiction, who have escaped it by the power of Christ, by making a choice in Christ's name and by Christ's power not to do those drugs anymore. And so are we to think then that in one person that power is simply too strong for Christ to overcome? Are we to think that a drug or pornography or some other illicit desire is so strong that even Jesus isn't strong enough to give a person victory over it? Like, I don't know. If I, if I, I mean, I do know. The answer to that is no. I don't know why Christians, I've heard lots of Christians talk this way, that like, the answer is more programs or AA or 
some kind of like we need to bring in a psychologist to answer whatever psychological dilemma is going on in the person's mind. They're gripped with the problems of psychology. I just don't see that in the scriptures. I don't see that ever given as the answer to man's most basic problems. That's never given as the answer. Never. What is the answer? Repent and believe. That's the answer. Follow Christ. That's the answer. That's the answer. And someone will say, I'm too weak to do it. Yes, you are. Absolutely you are. And that's, so am I. That's why it's supernatural. That's why I say this is not a natural thing that Peter is asking us to do. It's a supernatural thing. It's something which can only be done in the power of God. God alone. Only He's able to do it. Only He is able to free us from the grip of sin in no matter whatever manifestation that grip takes. He is able to free us. He is. He is. And at the same time that He is able to free us, when Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to work, like, there, I see some synergism there. It's not like we just sit back and say, hey, Lord, I have a fleshly lust that I'm totally given over to you. Can you just deliver me from that? I'm going to keep making the same choices I've been making, and I'll wait on you to change my heart and deliver me. <laughs> I don't see that either. That's not the exhortation. What is the exhortation? What is the command that Jesus gives? If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to go into heaven made. I'm reminded of the verse. Oh, you think that you've resisted your sin so much. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Think about that. <laughs> you have not yet resisted to that point. You think, oh, I've tried everything. I've gone to every meeting and I'm still addicted. You still haven't shed your blood. Right? So, I don't know how hard you're really trying, you know. I don't know what kind of decisions you're actually making. I think I've told the story once of a friend who had a very severe and long-lasting pornography addiction and then became a Christian and said to me, um, you know, I, I, I'm still still doing it, still look at it often, um, but I refuse to throw away my computer because Christ, I know Christ is stronger and he'll deliver me from this. And I'm just going to, won't, I won't even put any kind of software on the computer, I won't do anything like that because I know deliverance for me is coming. I said to him, that's just foolish, that's not what Jesus tells you to do. Like, expose yourself to the most temptation to see if you can overcome it. Well, no. Flee. Flee from it. Run. If your computer is causing you to sin, throw it out. If you can't throw it out because of work, then get the highest level of software you can possibly get on it. Do you, you must make choices. That's the point I'm trying to make. You must make choices. Toward holiness, toward abstention. And not merely wait and say, well, you know, I'm just going to see what God does and continue to live how I was living before. To abstain means to, means to be distant from the thing. To keep it far away. If, if, if there's uh, an, an indwelling sin 
there that you recognize, then today is the day for you to say, Lord, I cannot do it in my own strength. I'm too weak, and I want to make choices now. Choices. Actual, uh, exert my redeemed will that you have redeemed out of bondage to slavery, and I will exert my will to do whatever is necessary to abstain from this from now on. For your glory. Not because abstaining means I get to go to heaven. Not because abstaining means now you love me because I abstain. Rather, in obedience to you because I'm your slave, I'm going to make these choices. Because I love you. And I think what that shows us is that like when Paul says in Galatians 5, in 1 Corinthians 6, when he says that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, in other words, those who, who persist in these various sinful uh, uh, practices, that they won't go to heaven, their kingdom of heaven is not theirs. It's not so much that those individual sins themselves are the unforgivable sins, because they're not. Paul even says, such were some of you. His point is this, that if you don't practice repentance, then that is the evidence of a lack of regeneration. That's the evidence of a lack of a new heart. If you refuse to practice repentance, what that means is that that's pretty good evidence you're not a Christian, right? No matter how much theology you know, no matter how many times you've been to church, no matter if you have the Bible memorized, no matter any of that, if you refuse to put your faith into practice, then it's really not real faith. That's really the whole point of James, the book of James. People get confused about that and think that what James is saying is that you need works to go to heaven. He's not saying that. What he's saying is this, that true faith always results in works. It always does. Good works like repentance, good works like obedience to Christ, those things are the necessary fruit of a new life. They're the necessary fruit of being a Christian. And if those fruits are absent, then it probably means that there is no good tree there. There's no new life. Yeah. Peter says, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, look at which wage war against the soul. Um, Peter tells us to, us to abstain from these lusts for two basic reasons. Number one, because they wage war against the soul. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You see, so that these lusts then wage war against your soul because the practice of them denies the soul's entrance into heaven. Now lest I be accused of preaching works here, I just want to reiterate again that the lack of repentance for those things is evidence of a lack of regeneration. And the acting out of them is an attack on the soul for that reason. For the more one practices one's lusts, the harder the heart becomes and the harder repentance is. It's an amazing thing, too, uh, just to think about that. Because, you know, if we really do believe that all repentance and all conversion is a gift from God, which certainly the Scripture teaches that, 
all of it is, is a gift from God. And that no one is able naturally to turn from their sins and turn to Christ. No one is able to naturally. No one seeks God. There is none who is righteous. Oh no, not even one. Right? That's Paul's, what Paul's saying in Romans 3, uh, chapter 3. Okay. And yet, there seems to be in Scripture some kind of varying degree of hardness. I don't understand it. I don't know how that all works. But there's a reason why the author of Hebrews says, Today, if you hear his word, harden not your hearts. Right? Well, the natural man's heart is already a stone. So what does he mean, harden? Uh, can you make a stone harder? I suppose so. There might be, there must be some way in which we are able, or the natural man is able to further harden themselves more than what his hard heart naturally is. And I don't understand it. I don't know how that all works. And, and I, don't, I don't know, you know, because another, another part of me says, well, is anything too hard for God? Like, no, can God break through? The hardest heart, of course he can. Yes, the hardest person, the most uh, 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 recalcitrant sinner, God is able to save them. Absolutely he is. The blood of Christ is able to do it. But would I then recommend a person and say, hey, you know what? Maybe you should sin more so that it takes even more grace to save you. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. If you do that, all you're doing is waging war against your own soul. Think about that. The imagery that Peter is telling us there. When we give in to our lusts, we wage war against our own souls. It doesn't feel like that when we do it. Giving in to one's lusts feels pleasurable. That's why people do it. If it felt bad, no one would do it. <laughs> right? Like, duh, okay? But even though it might feel good to the body, it is treacherous to your soul. Treacherous. And the more we commit treachery against our soul, ultimately, the more we'll eventually be sorry. Even as believers, we'll be sorry for doing that. You know? Because all that is is building on the foundation using wood, hay, and stubble. And that'll all be burned away. And a person who does that, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he will experience loss on the day that they meet Christ. And I look, you know, as the preacher, I'm not immune to these things. I'm preaching this to my own heart and my own soul. Preaching to my own soul, soul. My own body. Do not wage war against your soul. Value your soul more than you do. Place a higher value on your soul than the gratification of your flesh. That's an exhortation I think that I need to have every single day. Place a higher value on your soul than on the gratification of your flesh. These lusts wage war against the soul because the, the practice of them denies the soul's entrance into the kingdom. Oh, that we would learn to protect our souls from those things which harm them. Our souls are more valuable than anything this world offers. And yet, how often do we choose the ways of the world over the eternal benefit of our soul? So the first reason why Peter tells us to abstain from fleshly lusts is because they wage war against our soul. The, the second reason that Peter tells us to abstain 
from our lusts is in verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So the second reason Peter tells us to abstain is that by doing so, we become a witness to the world of what a changed life and changed affections look like. Peter says that the world slanders us. Look at that. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, then glorify God on the day of visitation. All right. So the world slanders us. Well, what's slander? Slander means they tell a lie about you. Right? Publicly, the world is telling a lie about us. They're saying certain things about us that are not true. And unfortunately, persecution often comes as a result of slander and false accusations. Man, how I, like, how I wish that persecution only revealed itself in the form of, like, this man is preaching the gospel, arrest this man. Like, I wish it was just that. Like, I could take that, man. That's easy to take. Arrest me for preaching the gospel. Absolutely. But Satan is so crafty, and the worldly people are much more crafty than that. They're not going to say, well, we're arresting him because he's preaching the gospel. They're going to say, we're arresting, arresting him because he hates gay people. Right? That's happening right now in places like the UK. That's happening in places like Canada. And it's like, well, wait a second, all I'm doing is, is, is just reading the text, right? Some street evangelists go outside and they just preach the text, just reading it out loud. Get arrested, hate speech, throw him into prison. These Christians are haters. They hate everybody that's not like them. Slanderous. Just slanderous. It's not true. As a matter of fact... If I really hated those people who are in sin, I wouldn't call it out. I'd let them go to their just reward. If I hated them, that's what I would do. The reason, uh, at least a, that a biblical Christian, a, a, a Christian who really does love people as Christ tells us to love people, the reason a Christian will go out, say something to someone even on the street or even in their own family and say, look, I'm sorry to tell you this, but this is wrong before God. I love you. I care about you, but you need to repent of X, Y, Z, whatever the thing is. It's because you care about them and you love them and you don't want them to perish and be condemned. That's the reason why. You're then slandered as some kind of a hater. Some kind of a, 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 an evil person for doing so. And the world lies about Christians in other ways. Not just that. Not just that. The world does whatever it can do to discredit Christians wherever they may be. That's why Billy Graham always had someone else check in to his hotel room so that he couldn't be set up by evildoers. I even heard a story once that, that some photographer had hired strippers to barge into Billy Graham's hotel room half naked and they were there with a camera to try to take pictures of Billy Graham with a half naked woman in a hotel room. And that, I don't know if this is apocryphal or if it actually happened, I'm not sure, but the story goes, Billy Graham's intern or someone was in the room like, what is going on? And their plot was spoiled, right? They were trying to make headlines and set him up as an evildoer, as a wicked man. Um, and he knew that. He knew ahead of time that there's enough slanderers and evil people in the world that he's not going to put himself in that position. I mean, just think about what the world says about Mike Pence, vice president, right now. Just think about that for a second. 
what the world says about Mike Pence and his stance on not meeting with women alone. You know what they say? I've heard them say this. He must be so depraved that he just couldn't control himself if he were alone with a woman. And the, <laughs> the irony of that accusation is that that is the very thing that Pence knows about himself, both regarding the weakness of his own flesh and the wickedness of his accusers. Right? He knows that very thing. And so he says, I'm not even going to put myself in a position where that would even be an option. I respect that a lot. And, and honestly, apart from any kind of politics, man, I think that that man in the last four years has been a tremendous example uh, of what Christianity is uh, in spheres of power and influence. Uh, I mean, at least from what I've seen in the public, from what I've seen, it seems to me like he's probably a genuine Christian. Um, look at how the world slanders that guy. What he said, what they say about him. Just evil, evil stuff. But, Peter says, that there will be at least some who will both hear the gospel and see the actions of Christians and that God will use that in a saving way in their lives. Look at this. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. I've never met the guy, and I've never been in the situation where I've seen this happen with this particular person, but I would venture to bet that some of those people, if they actually met with the vice president, with Mike Pence, if they actually met him in person, those people who wickedly accuse him of all this kind of bad stuff, and then they see his true character in person, would say, wow, I was wrong. I was wrong about them. I had this idea in my mind, just because of what the world says about Christians, and I was wrong about it. You know, I hate that saying, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. I hate that saying, it's totally unbiblical, all right? The gospel is always with words. But I would say this, the gospel is not only with words. It's always with words, but it's not only with words. It's with words and it's with our actions as well. The world actually watches us. It waits to see, what is this person going to do? How is this person living? Especially if they know, you know, that's why like, I always encourage Christians who are bad drivers not to put a fish on their car, you know? Because like, come on, give a good testimony to people, right? <laughs> oh yeah, one of those again, you know? like. That's why I don't have a fish on my car, so I'm free to yell at anyone who cuts in front of me, you know, not to have to just joke. All right? No. Peter says that there'll be some who hear the gospel and see the actions of Christians, that God will use that in a saving way in their lives. I was just talking to this wonderful woman this week, godly woman, changed, uh, 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 just profoundly changed person for whom this was precisely the case. She saw her roommate's changed life after meeting Christ, and she told me the first thing she thought was, I need what she has. I need it. I need it. I see joy and brightness and, and exuberance and love coming out of this person for whom I did not see those things before. And... She asked her what it was, and the woman told her about the gospel, brought her to a pastor, and she heard the gospel, and she was saved. Uh, it really happens, you know. 
And we don't always know who's watching us, and eternity will reveal that. And perhaps we may be shocked at what we find. And therefore, we must live in such a way, we must live such God-honoring lives among unbelievers that they are able to find no legitimate cause for criticism or accusation. Let all their accusations against us be slander and only slander. Slander's okay. I can take slander. I can take it. If it's for Jesus, I could say, Ah, yes, Lord, you said, Blessed are you, when people say all kinds of false things about you. For they did the same thing about the prophets. And you are blessed in heaven because of that. Wow! Yes! I say, Amen. I want people to lie about me and to slander me. The truth, the truth shall be known someday. But let it be slander. Let it be slander and not accurate. Because the church is injured when an accusation is not slander, but accurate instead. And therefore, this is the point Peter's making to us. Not only do, does giving in to fleshly lust wage war against our souls, giving in to fleshly lust hurts the church. And it hurts the church in the eyes of the world. And therefore, we must abstain from them. For Christ's sake. And if we failed in the past, we failed. Now is the time to, you know, say, Lord, I repent. I want to stop failing. Help me to make choices toward that end. And move forward. Let the past be in the past. You can't live in the past. But today is the day now. If there's anything in our lives that we've neglected to take care of before the Lord that we know that we've been acting in a certain way and we have not repented of that thing yet. And today is the day of salvation, not just in terms of justification. Today is the day of salvation when we can even recommit to submitting our lives to our Master and the one who purchased us. Therefore, let us pray that Christ in His goodness and by the power of His death and resurrection would enable us to deny our lusts and to live for Him. Let's pray. O oh, our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that Your grace is so wonderful and uh, uh, beyond even what we hope for, that You have grace on us for things, for sins we didn't even know we committed. We bring all of these things to You. We love You, Lord, and we trust You, and we thank You for Your mercy and kindness to us. And I ask, Lord, that You grant us each repentance. Help us to abstain from the lust which so easily entrap and ensnare us. And give us freedom in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, we're going to take communion. Um, since there are not a lot of us here today, um, I suppose we can all just go up there individually. Are you going to pass it? Okay. Tim is going to pass it around, thankfully. One of the beautiful things about the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is that it draws our attention and our memory back to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Um, I need one too. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to take him too. It, thank you. It, thanks, brother. It draws our, our memory and our attention back to it. It shows us that by 
taking the bread and the drink, we are acknowledging our absolute dependency upon Christ and what he's done for us in what these things um, represent. And by taking it, I'm saying, yes, Lord, I need the body of Christ. The body of Christ, which was crucified on my behalf, I need it. I need what you've done for me on the cross. I need the blood of Christ to wash away my sin. I am utterly helpless and exposed outside of you, Lord Jesus. And by taking this together, we acknowledge our dependency upon him. And as I've said before, that by, by taking the communion together, we acknowledge our communal dependency upon Christ. The church's dependency upon Christ. Um, we acknowledge nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. And that, therefore, I'm not better than any other Christian ever that's ever lived. And we're all the same at the foot of the cross. That's what taking this brings us to remember that. To bring that into our minds. To focus on Jesus. Well, the Apostle Paul, who was at one time an enemy of God, an enemy of Christ, a persecutor of Jesus and of the faith, he was utterly given over to his fleshly desire for vengeance and evil until the Lord saved him and changed him. And then Paul was led by the Spirit to write these words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Oh yes, Lord. We love you and we thank you. We praise you for all that you've given to us. There is no more that you could give to us than you, what you've already given. And for that we are eternally grateful. Be with us now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Tim is going to come now and lead us in a closing song.